had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, uh -huh. because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to yes. the poor, and sent yes. me to heal the brokenhearted, mm -hmm. to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Yes. Yes. Verse 20, and he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him, fastened on him. And he, said, he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. As you're having your seat, look at somebody and tell them I was born for this. I was born for this. I was born for this. We're all familiar with Jesus, right? Those of us who are saved. I hope so. <laughs> Amen, Mr. Butts. I hope so. We're all familiar with Jesus. Jesus, But, you know, a lot of emphasis is put on Jesus' ministry from his birth. And then there isn't a whole lot said of his upbringing. And then he pops up again sometime around, his, around or after his 30th birthday. And after there, well, there's one instance in his early, well, his late preteen going into his teen years where his family leaves him at the synagogue. And then you don't hear from him again until just about now. And I like the way Luke records it because this is an important thing for us to look at as, as a body of believers. And I want to talk about that today. I know somebody might be thinking in their mind, that's a, it's kind of a vain message to preach on your first day. Well, I want to let you know that this message ain't about me. It's about you. Because understand here that this message entitled, I was born for this, is really about you. So go with us for a couple minutes and we're, we're going to get it into it. So now Jesus finds himself in a position where he's ready to begin ministry. Ministry is really about to start for Jesus and he, he finds himself now back in the synagogue. Let's back up a little bit and see what led us to these events. We all know about Jesus' birth. In Luke, the first chapter, Luke records the exchange between uh, Mary and Elizabeth. It talks about Mary and Elizabeth who were cousins and Elizabeth was the father, was the mother of John the Baptist, Mary the mother of Christ. And it talks about their exchange and through verse 2 and even in the verse 3 there's very little mention of Jesus other than little things here and there. It's mostly about John the Baptist. But about midway through the third chapter there's a point where Jesus is about to be baptized and when he gets baptized a dove descends out of heaven, the sky cracks, and a voice comes from heaven, and it says, Here is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is God now speaking out into the atmosphere and to, to Jesus, his affirmation of who he is. How many of us have heard God speak there, an affirmation over them of who you are in him? Most of us go through life so many times, and we fail to hear the voice of God because there are so many voices around us, whether it's the voice of our parents, whether it's the voice of our friends, the voice of our surroundings. Some of us uh, in the surroundings that we, we're in, we're taught because, oh, I grew up in a poverty neighborhood that I can't attain or achieve anything more that's around us. And that voice keeps playing in your head. If you're African-American descent, you might have had a voice that was told you by someone who was a little bit more lighter skinned that you'd never be more than a truck driver. It don't make no sense for you to go to school. Some of us, I used yeah. to hear stories about even how they would put the African-American children in an earlier generation, they would put them in vocational training and not even let them go to college prep. That's what they thought about us. So if you're hearing these voices over and over again, it's kind of hard to pay attention to the greatest voice. Now, I was watching a preacher the other day and he said a lot of crazy stuff, but one of the things that he did say that I did agree, agree with is he said the whisper of God has to be greater than the noise of everything around you. And so and sometimes it's so hard to hear the whisper of God with everything that's going on in our lives. Sometimes you, 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 you got family, you got bills, you got kids, you got Got all of these things going on and it's hard to hear God speaking what he has for you oh Lord. so often we go through life never achieving or understanding our purpose in God because we've been set in a certain way we've been uh -huh. set in a certain mindset this is the only job I can get this is all I can do all I can do is 
sing in the church. They're not going to allow me to preach. All I can do is play the keyboard or the organ, play the drums. All I can do is sit and be a pew member. I'm not eloquent enough. I can't read Greek or Hebrew. I can't do any of the things that are required for, for me to be a minister. But understand something. If you're saved, you're already a minister. Yes, Jesus gave the great commission. He told, us, he told his disciples, and that applies to us today, to go out into the highways, into the hedges, and compel them to come. So when you're walking in your life every day, as Paul writes, that you're living epistles that are read of men, that you are a living, walking, breathing minister each and every day. Whether you stand in the pulpit, whether you ever preach a sermon, whatever you ever do, if you never get behind this desk, you are a minister. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm a minister. And you don't have to wait till for a man to lay hands on you and for you to be ordained by a man. Well, I understand that most people, and I'm just going to be perfectly honest, a, a, a lot of people, and the, no, I'm not even going to be nice about it, a lot of leaders are intimidated by some of the things that they see in their congregations. So they won't lay hands on you because they know that you might exceed them. And we talked about this a little bit on yesterday at the ordination. It's right for the, 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 the protege to exceed the master because that proves what a good job the master did. But understand that the credit is always I'll go back to the leaders. So I want leaders to stop being so full of themselves and selfish, and I'm gonna leave that alone. So now we talk about Jesus. The voice has cracked the sky in chapter three, and God has spoken his affirmation. Now it's interesting to note that after God speaks this to Jesus, there is no more mention of Jesus other than his genealogy in the rest of Luke chapter three. But now we pick up in chapter four after God has spoken his affirmation over your life, because I want to put you in the place of Jesus today. God has spoken his affirmation over your life, and now the next thing that happens is temptation. That's right. Chapter four starts off this way. It lets us know that Jesus got alone, and it was time for him to go on his fast. Understand when you're charged to do anything for God, there will be a period of aloneness. There will be a time where you'll need to get by yourself so that you can hear that loud whisper that you've been missing all your life. Uh, what are you talking about, Brother Minister? It came a point for Abraham where God got him alone and he began to speak to him. Understand, Abraham didn't know who God was. They worshipped pagans where he grew up. All he knew, his father was an idol worshiper. But God got him to a point where he was alone and he began to speak. And unfortunately, some of us guilty as charged included. Sometimes we hear the voice of God, we know the voice of God, but yet we sit down. And this is what happens because the voices are louder than the whisper. So you get stuck because you're, you're being told that you can't be no more than what you are. And I'm gonna be honest, I was never told that in my house. That was never that was never the thing. I was always raised to be all that I could be. But then when you get around other folks and you start seeing other things, and you when you and, and, and it's funny because when you start to act on the things of God and you start to act out what God will want for you to have. Things begin to go haywire and crazy. That's People right. you thought were with you start turning on you. Right. Yeah. Everything start acting crazy. Your finances go crazy. It seems like you take two steps forward and it's five steps back. But I want to point you to Jesus in the first in the fourth chapter of Luke. The Bible says in verse one that Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. I want us to understand something that you don't have to go in your own power. I need you to understand that after God speaks His affirmation over your life, that you're in, you're going to be full of the Holy. Ghost. When God speaks his affirmation over your life, you don't need any other validation. When God speaks his affirmation over your life, uh, you don't need a man, woman, boys, a boy, girl, dog, cat, rat, nobody to tell you that you're anointed. So the Bible says that Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost and he returned to Jordan. And he was there 40 days and then he was tempted of the devil. Now, I want to go through these temptations. Because I looked at him and it got, it got real crazy for me for a second. The devil said unto him what? He said, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. And Jesus ah. answered him with the word. And we get stuck on how Jesus answered him with the word. And it's true and it's good. But I looked at how the devil tempted him. And the three things that are listed here. And the types of things that they were. Yes, Understand? Because for where you're going yes. in ministry, where yes. you're going in your life, uh, there are certain types of temptation yes. that God, that the devil will, will yes. come with, that God will allow him to tempt with to bring you out to where you need to be. So when he says command these stones to be made bread, the first thing he's tempting in Jesus is the desire or the passion. Understand when you've been starving something for a long time, there is a desire and a passion to eat them. Understand that it was because David could not quench and hold his desires that he had a man killed so he could have his wife. Anybody know the story of David and Bathsheba? Look at somebody and tell them your passion. 
actions will get you in trouble. Yeah, yeah, we're still talking about you being born for this, but I want to help you get there on this morning. Is that all right? So the first thing he deals with is the passion. My desire for food, my desire for things. Now, your desire may be to be on Facebook. Your desire may be to be on Twitter. Your, your desire may be a man. Your desire may be a woman. Your desire may be more money. Now, understand something. What he was, at, what the devil was essentially doing here in testing Jesus' passion was he was saying to him, I know you got the power to do certain things. But what are you going to use your power for? Oh boy. Mm. Oh boy. It's an interesting yeah. thing that we have all of this power, but what are we using our power for? Oh Let me put it the way Spider-Man put it. He said, with great power comes great responsibility. I'm sorry, no, that was Uncle Ben. That was, his, that, was, that was his uncle that said that. So it's Uncle Ben. He said, with great power, there's great responsibility. The Bible puts it this way. So much is given, much is required. So now he tells Jesus his passions, his desire, what he wants. Then the devil took a high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, all the power I will give thee. Now, you just tested his power. Uh, but now you're claiming you can offer him power. The next thing that the enemy will mess with is your ego. Uh, he will start making you think that you are all that, better than this. You were the best thing since light is spread. You preached a great message one day. Everybody shouted. The wings flipped back and everybody went crazy. Now all of a sudden you're the man. It happens. You get puffed up. So you now, because God did one great exploit through you, now all of a sudden you're ready to be a bishop. God used you one time. But now you are his apostolic grace. So he, he tries the ego. What is the thing about the ego that makes us crazy? Not just pride, but it's our desire to be loved. Nobody ever looked at it that way. Because we often equate the ego with pride, but understand that that whole pride thing is out of a desire to be loved. Think about it, ladies. When you get up in the morning, a lot of you are going to say, yeah, I dress for me. I get dressed for me. Let's be honest. Some of you, when you were single, you dressed for the man. It's quiet. I like that. All the brothers say amen. Oh, no, I got to be careful. I'm in my church. Right. 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 So now, it's starting to look at somebody tell smile, give face a break. It's okay to laugh and smile right. in church. Because sometimes the word is funny. But we, we've got to understand something. It all begins with our desire to be loved. Yes. It was Leah's desire to be loved in Genesis yes. that found her having baby after baby for a man that did not reciprocate that love. Right. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. Y'all thought I was going to open. I'm getting old. I can't do that. Anymore. Every now and then it might come out, but I, I didn't feel that today. So come back next week. Maybe it'll be the next week. Because I, I, I want us to understand our purpose. Yes. One of our one of my biggest desires is for people to understand their purpose in God. Yes. Yes. Because we yes. walk around purposeless, going from church to yes. church and service to service, but we never fulfill what God wants for our lives. Okay. We're gonna get into that some more in a second. Yes. So now He's dealing with the love issue. My desire for attention. Uh -huh. My desire to be seen. And all of us have it. Mm -hmm. If we're honest with ourselves, all of us have the desire, hey, look at me. Yep. Suppress that in himself. And Jesus answered, what did he say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And then the third temptation. He brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee. Now it's interesting, th this is the next thing that the enemy will mess with. There is a difference between faith and presumption. That's right. Yes. So the enemy realizes, okay, I, I can't mess with you. With, you, you. You know who you are. Okay. I can't deal with the passion. Okay, well, God said this word. If you do this, he'll back it up. So go ahead and do it. And some of us think that faith is, okay, well, yeah, I'm just going to leave. No. A 
understand, what you do has to be in the will of God. Uh -huh. yes. Not my will, but thy will be done. So it's important for us to understand that we just can't go off doing stuff just because we feel like it. That's right. You running around, running through the street, laying hands on people right. on the bus. You can't do that. No, sir. Right. They lay hands on you. <laughs> they will lay hands on you. And it won't be holy. No. Right. No. You can't do that. It's, it's funny, but I, but I want us to see this because each of us as believers has gone through a test like this. The enemy has messed with your passion. He's messed with your ego. And he's messed with your faith. Sometimes all at the same time. That's right. Yes, that's true. But Jesus has the fortitude and he stands through it. And then we start our text in verse 14, but it says, Now when Jesus returns to, in the returns in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. The Bible says that there was fame that was wrought about about wrought about throughout Galilee in their synagogues. So he went around teaching and being glorified of all. Be careful of the fame that will follow the anointing that is placed on your life. Yes. Be because understand people will begin to cry out your name. But a good friend of mine wrote a song called This Week Hosanna. Anybody who knows the Bible yeah. will understand what yeah. that song is about. They cry, they'll cry Hosanna on Sunday. Right. By Friday they'll be ready to kill you. Yeah. But it's interesting to note that Jesus doesn't give heed to any of this. The Bible says he never says that he responded to, looked at it, did anything any differently. But the Bible says he came to Nazareth. And why is Nazareth important? The, Nazareth is important in this text because this is the place where Jesus grew up. Amen. This is the place where they knew him well. This is where they said, okay, this is Joseph's son. This is the boy that Joseph had, Joseph and Mary. There was whispers about that whole relationship. Because wait, we saw Mary, she was pregnant before Joseph. And her. So Jesus was kind of that child. They didn't really know what was going on. So those were, he was the one they were whispering about. And some of you are the ones that they're whispering about. Some of you are the ones that they're talking about in secret places. They're, those are the ones, you're the ones that they're putting up secret statuses about on Facebook and, and, and they're throwing off on Twitter. I believe in acting people if I got something to say. That's just me. You're the one that, that, that they're looking at kind of strange because they know you. Understand that familiarity can breed contempt. So Jesus now in this place has to go back to where he grew up to let them know I'm not what I used to be. The little boy that you once saw is no longer here. I dare you to look at somebody and tell them the little boy, the little girl that you once knew is no longer here. We said at the beginning of service that God was doing a new thing in us. Understand that's what this text is about. God did a thing in Jesus from chapter 3 into chapter 4 where now Jesus' ministry at 30 can begin. And some of you have been waiting for years for your ministry to begin. You've been waiting for God to anoint you and now you're full of the Holy Ghost and the first thing that God wants you to do is go back to your family. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Everybody's being called to the nations. I asked my wife a question. I said, if everybody's going to the nations, who's going to stay home? That's the end thing in the church. They want to get prophecies about going to the nations, but I'm going to leave that alone. That's not what this is about. <laughs> So Jesus goes back to his own people. And this was a custom. Now I want you to understand, this was not out of the ordinary for Jesus to read the scripture in the temple. This was not out of this. This was something he did normally. So understand what's happening here. Jesus walks in. They hand him the book and said, do what you normally do. For some of us, we're in situations, in churches with people that when we get around them, they expect a certain thing from us. They expect a certain thing out of us. They only know us one way. Well, Minister Bush, you're a singer, so you're here, so sing. But God might have put a prophetic word in his mouth. You hear Pastor Harvey? Preach. Pastor Harvey didn't need to jump on the drums today. Understand that there was a, there was, and I want you to understand that it wasn't done deliberately, but there was a box that they were putting Jesus in. You usually do this, so this is what you're going to do. I'm going to hand you this book, and you're going to read like you normally read. Then just pick something like you normally do, and just go ahead and read it. And it was interesting that Jesus goes to the prophet Isaiah. And the words that are found here, starting at verse 18, are paralleled in Isaiah 62, verses 1 and 2. Where he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year 
fear of the Lord. Now that's just the first two verses. There's a lot more going on, but the Bible says that Jesus closed the book. I need you to understand something, that when God puts you in a position where he's ready to expose you to the world, after he says what he needs to say, sometimes you've got to close the book. What did the closing of the book represent? Closing the book here represents that now you have heard what God is getting ready to do in this season. We get caught up sometimes because we got the disease of me and we wanted to be about us and we add stuff to it and we take stuff away from it. But I dare you in this season of your life that when you open the book to rightly divide the word of truth, when you open the book to get a word for yourself, when God stops, you stop. My God. Yes. this because that probably wasn't the reading that was on the list for that day the bible says that he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and he sat down jesus said there is no more validation needed i i don't have to wait for you to say anything i i was out at the water in jordan and while i was out there my father spoke to me from heaven and for some of you it was in your secret closet god said for you to get up and write a book it was in your secret closet god told that you had to go and minister to the poor. You don't need a pulpit to go and minister. You don't need a pulpit to go out and feed a hungry person. You don't have need a pulpit to, to go out and minister to your family. Understand that Jesus now understanding who he was. And I, I really understand now that we really don't know who I, we are. And because we don't know who we are, we're operating in positions that God never intended for us to operate in. Ah, oh, yeah. Understand, we're a body with many members, and if one member is out, is out of place, I, I, can, can I talk about you for a second, Mom? My mother is in the audience. Very recently, my mother broke her thumb, and we were talking one day, and she talked about how difficult it was now with a broken thumb to even do something right. as simple as put on clothing. Yes. That's right. Yes. Understand that when you're out of joint, right. you can cause pain to the entire body. Jesus. And some of us have been operating out of joint. Some of us have been operating in ministries we had no business in. Some of us have been operating in positions that we have no business in. But I came to invoke a paradigm shift on you today. Because I need you to understand what is the shift in a paradigm. It's a changing of the way you've been thinking. And understand a paradigm shift will cause you to disbelieve everything that you've been taught all your entire life. So when you shift the paradigm, I've changed the way I'm thinking. So it causes me to look at things and situations in a different way. What Jesus was doing right here, he was forcing the people into a paradigm shift. They were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for the king. They were waiting for the one that would bring deliverance. So Jesus comes and he reads this word and he says, I've come to shift your way of thinking. All that you've been waiting for is standing right in front of you. All that you've been looking for is right here for you. All you have to do is accept it. All you have to do is believe it. You don't have to look in the outside anymore. I was trying not to preach, but here it comes. Now, I, I, I don't need any validation. You don't have to wait or look for another. Even John the Baptist's people at one point, they weren't sure if Jesus was the one. So they sent word to him and said, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus got a little upset with them. And he said, yeah, I'm the one. I'm the one who came to deliver. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And just like it's upon me, it's upon you today. He has anointed you to preach the gospel to the poor. He's anointed you to set the captives for free. I need you to shift your paradigm. You don't have to stay in that low place anymore. You don't have to stay in the place of do nothing. You don't have to sit on that seat anymore about what mommy said, what daddy said. Look at somebody and tell them God's changing my name this morning. Understand that with a shift in paradigm, names start changing. Yes, yes, yes. Abram becomes Abraham. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. Jacob becomes Israel. But look at the interesting thing about Jacob and Israel. Jacob and Israel would war with each other for the rest of Jacob's life. I got anybody that knows the word of God on this morning. There are certain places in Genesis where they would call him Jacob and in the next sentence it would call him Israel. And it's around the 49th chapter where the Bible says that Jacob was sick and he called his sons around because he knew he was about to die. But now God needed to bring a word that the Bible says that Israel stood up. There are some times when the old nature will put you in a
a position where the new nature has to stand up and get you out of it. And we wrestle this, power, this paradox in our lives. For most of our lives, I'm wavering about sexuality. I'm wavering about who I am. I'm wavering whether or not I want to go to school or whether I want to work. I'm wavering about what I want to do. And a lot of times, we, we did this in error. We've told people all their lives, well, you need to get yourself together. You need to know where you're going. Sometimes it takes you your whole life to get there. Just ask Jacob. Right. 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 So now I don't judge the situation because my brother and sister may be overtaken in something. I just look for the new nature to stand up. So now Jesus preaches this word. He closes the book and he gives it to the minister and he sits down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue are fastened on him. And he said to them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. That sounds like a real cocky statement, doesn't it? But things are going to sound cocky when you know who you are. Yes, yes. I've come to realize that. Yes. And it doesn't mean that you are. Right. We about to be transparent. There are a lot of times in my life where I've taken a back seat knowing better. Knowing yeah. that God wanted me to speak into a situation. Amen. And did not because I feared how people would perceive or receive it. Uh, oh yeah, that's gone. I don't yes, care. Yes. But I understand that I missed the assignment of God in some cases. Because I was worried about folks. So I admonish you today, don't worry about Jesus. If God has put a word in your mouth, speak it. I love it. Understand that you're in a position where you can be like Elijah. What do you mean be like Elijah? Yes. Elijah went to Ahab and his wife Jezebel and said, check this out. Y'all acting up. Okay, this is the Dwayne version again. Y'all acting up. So there ain't going to be no rain or no dew in here. Till I say so. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. This was not a prophetic word that God gave him to utter. That's right. <laughs> but because God honored him, That's right. yes. he backed up yes. his word. Right. Yes. yes. Some of you are in a place now Witness. where all you got to do is speak, and God's going to honor what you speak. But that's why you had to go through that temptation. Yes. Because see, the devil wanted Jesus to speak out of season. He wanted them to speak something that would benefit him. But what you're going to speak is what the Lord speaks. What are we speaking? We're speaking the word of the Lord. In this season, we've got to become better students of heaven. <laughs> What's the, the, the model prayer says? Our kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Come on, say it with me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You didn't get it yet. Say it again. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Ah, somebody got it. Everything is already accomplished in heaven. That's right. So when you speak heaven's language, everything that's already accomplished there has to be accomplished here. That's right. 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 You want your children saved? Speak the word over their lives. Yes. Go in their rooms at midnight and lay hands on them like my mama did some nights. I'm being transparent. She thought I was still asleep. I was. <laughs> but it helped because I was acting up. I'm standing here today because of those prayers. Yes, Lord. But she prayed the word over my life. She prayed that God's will would be done in my life. When I needed healing, she spoke healing over my life. My mother acted like she had a walk in a prophetic man too, so I'm gonna leave it. But she was literally prophesying over my life. Understand, I'm closing. Prophecy is not just the foretell, but it's the foretell. 
Forth telling is the ability to speak into something that's, that's not right. already yes. there. Yes. 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 I can speak into existence my harvest because the word of the Lord says so. Right. What do you mean the word says so? The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So that what God has for me belongs to me. And anything I want that's in his will is mine. I decree and declare by the authority of the name of Jesus. Y'all looking at me crazy, but some of you need to grab hold to that. Some of you need to begin to prophesy over your children, over your family. Wives whose husbands might not be saved. Stop fighting with the man. Prophesy over his life. When he sleep, lay hands on his butt. Amen. I'm going to get in trouble. Aunt Stephanie, lay hands on Uncle Larry. <laughs> Being real. Man. Jesus. Prophesy to him. Don't fight with him no more. Prophesy to him. Mm. And watch the word of God manifest. And I'm not talking about something I heard. Quick testimony. I was working at a job some of last year. Job was cool. It was all right. I wasn't happy with it because the hours was all jacked up. I was working Tuesday through Saturday. I was working late. I was missing church. I wasn't happy. Getting home late. Just completely unhappy. And it's funny because I got fed up one day. And I was on Twitter. Twitter's my guilty pleasure. I speak my mind. I get in trouble. I speak my mind. Nothing crazy, I just speak my mind. Some things that I can't say to church folks, I say. <laughs> and I was sitting, I was on my lunch break at that same job, and I was going through my Twitter timeline, and I just got fed up with my situation. I was thinking about it, and I prophesied to myself. I had gone on an interview at J.P. Morgan Chase, I know, biggest bank in the world. Yes, it is. Bank of America needs us to bail them out now. <laughs> and, yeah, unfortunately, I do. But, um, I got on an interview on Thursday. I was at work on Saturday. Upset because I had to work till 10 o'clock. Not happy. Sitting there upset on my brain. And sitting there on Twitter. My wife will tell you, and if you go to my Twitter page and you look at the, the stuff back, you'll see it. I decreed and declared on Twitter that the bank would call me by Tuesday. On Tuesday afternoon while I was at work, my phone rang with a 614 area code. Anybody who knows J.P. Morgan Chase knows that human resources is in Columbus, Ohio. So I ran off the floor and grabbed the phone. <laughs> Left my reps and everything, it was terrible. Because I knew who was calling. And I picked up the phone, and Jane Stiebel, yeah, I remember her name, introduced herself to me and she said, when we want to we, we thank you for interviewing with us last week, and we want to offer you a management position with us. Wow. Wow. On the very day that I spoke, mm -hmm. and I went to praising God, and God stopped me and said, I told you I backed up what you spoke when you wow. spoke. Wow. Amen. And then I began to look at other things that I had spoken and God had backed up <laughs> over my life. Right. And I said, <laughs> You're thinking it's strange, but I've been doing it all along. Yes, You've yes. just been speaking the wrong things. Yes. Wow. Witness. When God speaks, speak what he speaks. Yes. Israel Hope put it this way. Say what you heard so you can see what you said. Yes. 